journey to the moon began with one step. And the stars are where we're headed. There are no limits to our efforts to explore space. This frontier has always called us, not only to work and learn, but to live. For over 50 years, Collins Aerospace has supported humans in space. From spacesuit technology used on Gemini to man's first steps on the moon. And now, space is life. A dynamic, evolving commercial market where efficiency, cost, and time are of the essence. So Collins is looking forward yet again, designing a new class of human life support systems. The ECLES, Environmental Control and Life Support System. Unparalleled operational experience, proven reliability. Collins Aerospace has been designing and developing environmental control and life support systems since the Apollo era. Today we provide systems that keep astronauts alive in space on the International Space Station and the Orion uh, multi-purpose crew vehicle. The closest systems to a regenerative loop Modular, compact, ready to meet current and future customer needs. The highest level of efficiency for air and water regeneration. ECLES lets the environment take care of itself. Automated. Easy to maintain. We see some customers that need scalable capability. And so this means that you might start with a more open loop solution and evolve into a more closed loop solution or start with that closed loop solution. Either way, we're gonna have systems that we can give you that can provide those capabilities. Supported by a new facility with new state-of-the-art capabilities to design, build, and test solutions for commercial clients. The best in class. Today, there's a variety of customers that are all trying to commercially establish a human presence in space. And they're all tackling this problem in different ways. So they have different needs in terms of the number of crew members, the duration of the mission, and their concept of operations. So we realize that we need to be flexible and our systems need to be adaptable to be able to satisfy those different needs. We've designed systems that are very maintainable, very easy to interface with, and really reduce the crew time necessary and the sparing necessary. Our next evolution of technology gives everyone access to space. Priced for pioneering commercial companies, enabling sustainability, leveraging predictive performance, capable of dormant periods, designed for the future. With this system, we're doing more than just keeping people alive. Our solutions are enabling people to live, work, and play in space. This journey continues straight to the stars. The future is calling us. The Collins Aerospace ECLIS. To ensure that we can not only live in space, but thrive. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. So um, I'm Darren Samplatsky, um, moderating today's panel. I will introduce our four fine panelists, uh, all ECLIS experts. Yes, no? Um, <laughs> you can spell it. I'm not going to go through their profiles. Uh, if, if you want to see those, their bios, they're all online. But uh, you know, it, it, we have a, a, a great mix of, of uh, years of experience uh, working the, the various ECLIS. So uh, I'm Darren Samplatsky. I'm the associate director of business development for Collins Aerospace. Uh, I've been working um, environmental systems for probably the last 26 years. Um, to my left is Robert Rick Richter. He is uh, from Sierra Space. He is the director of environmental systems. Uh, next to Robert is Phoebe Henson. She's from Honeywell, senior advanced systems engineer, human space R&D. Um, next to Phoebe is Jim Broyan. Uh, Jim is the ECLIS uh, crew health and performance. I, I didn't have to, I even, I, have to look it up. Um, <laughs> systems capability lead, and, and Jim, you're new to that role. I, I guess you'll talk a little bit about that. I guess you've been doing it for a while. Yeah, I've been in the lead since September, and I was a deputy for two years prior to that. 
And then last but certainly not least, Barry Finger. He's the Vice President of Engineering um, for Paragon. So um, the way we're going to work this is uh, each of the panelists is going to get up, talk uh, for about 10 minutes. Uh, after that, we're going to do some questions and answers. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions, and then probably the last 15 minutes or so, uh, we'll have questions from the audience. So, Robert? So good afternoon. Four score. <laughs> Four score. I'd like to thank Darren for giving us the opportunity to get up here and talk a little bit about our company and closed loop Eclis. Um, they had me go first because they wanted to set the bar low so the other people <laughs> look better, I guess. Um, but I'm game. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> uh, so Sierra Space, I just wanted to give a little bit of overview about Sierra Space. It's the, one of the newer names in the aerospace industry. Um, it's a newer name, however, it's really comprised of a deeper uh, background than that. Uh, been around for over 30 years, and we've actually participated in over 500 missions. It's just that one year ago, uh, we were carved out from Sierra Nevada Corporation and became uh, a space entity, Sierra Space, and it allowed us to go pursue additional funding and to do things that when we were tied with uh, the old Sierra Nevada, we weren't able to do. So. We're really excited uh, with that opportunity. Um, right now, we're, we're completing the integration and testing of the Dream Chaser vehicle. That's an unmanned vehicle. And we're also working on a large inflatable habitat. Uh, in that one, we're gonna be incorporating some closed loop life support equipment. And then we're also ramping up as we get the uncrewed version of Dream Chaser completed. We're gonna be working on a crewed version of the Dream Chaser vehicle. Next. Uh, I mentioned the large inflatable or integrated uh, <coughs> flexible environment that is our life mm -hmm. habitat which is an inflatable habitat that is relevant for a mission to Mars because we do believe that increasing the available volume to the crew will be very important during a long mission as you can imagine we're talking many months of transit the opportunity to have more volume to do more things uh, we feel is valuable so we're uh, working on that first step is obviously working with our partner uh, Blue Origin for commercial LEO destination, but we really see that as a stepping stone to evolve it and really move towards uh, longer duration applications. Um, part of that is the closed loop uh, ECLIS, which we've looked at, uh, done some trade studies, and everything really points to you need closed loop ECLIS in order to make the whole thing work. Next slide, please. Um, so this is not an eye chart, uh, or meant to be an eye chart in some ways. On the upper right, I, I, I put a chart, and uh, whenever I've given a presentation at a conference, you put data on the screen, and 10 people will agree and 50 people will disagree. What was your data premised on? And that's not the intent of this chart. Uh, the chart in the upper right was just an example of the first year of operation, what happens when you go from open loop ECLIS to closed loop ECLIS. Uh, the vertical axis is in kilograms. So the first data point in the upper left is open loop ECLIS. And we can reduce the mass in the first year by about 10% by just looking at a regenerable CO2 system. And then we can drop another about 65% of the mass by incorporating water recovery, water processing, those type of things. And then as we continue to add more and more technologies to close the loop, you can see we continue to decrease that first year of uh, mass that's required to operate for this particular use case. Again, it's very dependent on number of crew and some other things, but in general, uh, it, it really points to that wa water recovery is very important. You can see the significant increase uh, or increase in mass savings, which obviously as you go on multiple years, you keep recovering more and more of that benefit. So. That's really the intent of this slide and the takeaway, and uh, just to show some of the hardware uh, that we've produced at Sierra Space as well. So that's all I have. And, and I see you're hiring. Yeah, we're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> Are you looking? No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll talk after. <laughs> <laughs> So Phoebe, you got to tell a joke while we, while we wait. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Oh, no. 
Uh, <laughs> I do not, no. <laughs> uh, all right. I'll, um, I'll take this, yeah, I'll take this time to introduce myself. My name is Phoebe Henson. I am a senior advanced systems engineer at Honeywell Aerospace, where I work on life support technology research and development. Um, and I am very honored to be part of such a fine panel of uh, true experts in the field. I uh, am, am much newer to this industry than I think um, some, of, some of the other experts are. going to say we have great <laughs> I think that's no. what I heard. There's some telltale no. signs. No. Great hair, great hair, yes. no hair. That was my joke, thank you. Mic drop. That would be old. <laughs> I knew you had a joke. Yes. <laughs> You can go to the next slide, and I think the one after that as well. Uh, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> All right. Um, so I just want to quickly introduce Honeywell. Honeywell is a Fortune 100 company. Uh, I'm sure that all of you guys know us for uh, all of our other products, thermostats, airplane engines. What a lot of people don't know is that we have a very long history of space flight. We've been on every single US human space mission since the very first one, Mercury. Uh, we also are on 80% <coughs> of all satellite missions. So uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, so uh, there are a lot of challenges with going to Mars. Uh, that is going to be much harder than all of the other missions that we've done so far. Uh, but I think that the main challenges that we're going to face are the three that I listed here, the quantity of consumables, uh, the hardware reliability issue and astronaut time, and then communication la latency as well. Uh, the first two are uh, really because of the cost of sending people to, to Mars, which is so much further away than ISS, and also communication latency is also due to how far, uh, how far we are from Mars and the fact that uh, mission control will not be there to do all of that monitoring of the ecosystems and everything else for us. So uh, you can go ahead and go to the next one. All right. So uh, about the quantity of consumables and what we think the best strategy forward is for uh, reducing the consumables for a mission to Mars, I think uh, we all agree if we're at this conference that if we want to go to Mars, we want to go there and go to stay. We want the mission to be sustainable. Um, and for that reason, reason, decreasing the consumables and making the mission more cost effective is going to be key to that. Uh, right now on ISS, our uh, oxygen recovery from carbon dioxide is limited to just 50%. Um, and Honeywell is working on a new technology to close that loop to 100%. Uh, and we'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, and also, I think long term, once we're on Mars, we should also be working on uh, using the Martian resources to, to make some of the, uh, the resources for, for the humans, things like oxygen and, and water as well. For hardware and reliability, hardware reliability and the quantity of orbital replacement units, uh, this has to do also with the fact that ISS sends uh, cargo, or for ISS, we send uh, cargo missions up uh, for both the, the consumables and um, uh, orbital replacement units every couple of months. And that's really not going to be feasible for a mission to Mars, at least not in a cost-effective way. So uh, developing more uh, robust technologies or fixing uh, the hardware reliability issues with the technologies on board ISS are going to be key to making uh, Mars a sustainable mission. Uh, and likewise, uh, al along those lines, I think that we, we do need more testing, uh, both in space and on the ground, especially of the integrated ECLIS system, because uh, ECLIS is made by not just one company, it's not just one ECLIS, it's a huge series of systems made uh, by all of the, the companies who are 
who are here on this panel and, and more. Uh, if we are going to uh, bring other technologies to Mars, we should also consider dissimilar redundancy as well. And for communication uh, latency, the uh, big key to that is, I think, collecting more data on the systems that we have, again, both through testing in space and here on the ground, uh, and making sure that th with that data we develop more autonomous monitoring and control systems. So really quickly, uh, since I work in research and development, I want to tell you about the cool, amazing new technologies that uh, we are de developing to solve these problems. The first one is our methane pyrolysis assembly technology, which is the technology that will enable us to bring our oxygen recovery from CO2 up from less than 50% up to close to 100%. Uh, the way that we do this is by uh, using, leveraging the technologies that have already been proven on ISS, the Sabatier reactor and the electrolyzer, uh, and coupling onto that a third system, the methane pyrolysis assembly. This system takes the carbon and hydrogen in methane and separates them through a process called carbon vapor deposition. So what you're left with is pure hydrogen and a solid car carbon puck. Uh, which we can use for things like building materials on Mars, uh, and the hydrogen can go back to the Sabatier reactor to double the amount of water produced and thereby double the amount of oxygen provided to the astronauts. Uh, this technology is currently being developed with the help of NASA, and uh, we are currently uh, in the process of uh, delivering a system to Marshall Space Flight Center for integrated testing with the other systems. Next slide. Okay. And then the other technology uh, that Honeywell is investing in in order to uh, make the trip to Mars easier is our carbon dioxide removal by ionic liquid system. It's a carbon dioxide removal technology that unlike the previous system, uh, the CEDRA, which Honeywell also developed, um, uh, is designed to be much more reliable and was designed in, uh, in this century. <laughs> the, uh, the CEDRA was actually uh, developed uh, for Skylab, so it's incredibly old. And at least in the industrial world, we've made a ton of progress in technologies to capture carbon dioxide. So this is really leveraging a lot of the things that we know uh, from the in and have learned from the industrial world for space. Uh, so this technology uses a very long-lasting sorbent called an ionic liquid, uh, which is a huge plus using a liquid instead of a solid sorbent bed because uh, sorbents, they can either degrade over time or uh, they can have issues for other reasons. With cedrals and using a liquid system, you can easily just bring up an extra liter of liquid if your CO2 removal system isn't working right. You don't need to carry an entire new system or spare bed uh, or pair or four beds. You can just carry uh, a little bit of extra liquid and hopefully that will make uh, the, the issue of spares a lot easier. Uh, this system is also far more effective at removing carbon dioxide. It can maintain extremely low levels of CO2 using far less uh, mass and power. Uh, we've shown recently that it removes a number of trace contaminants that are on ISS and planned for Deep Space Gateway. Uh, and on top of that, also to do with reliability, uh, the system is incredibly robust to the absorption of water, uh, which is also contrary to solid, solid beds like, like CEDRA. So uh, again, we are developing this technology with the help of NASA. Uh, we uh, actually, NASA Advanced Exploration Systems is I think now called uh, Exploration Capabilities. Uh, and we have six ground demonstrations ground demonstrations of this technology, and we're currently in the process of designing uh, the flight prototype as well. All right, and that is everything that I have. Thanks, Phoebe. Oh. Jim? So, Jim, you got to tell a joke. I'll just tell jokes about Darren here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, no, I'm Jim Broyan. Um, 
mentioned um, the, the mouthful uh, environmental control life support systems hyphen crew health and performance system capability leadership team but that's why we use acronyms um, so um, I'm happy to be here uh, I'll just talk a little bit about um, our SCLT, and I might, that's my next chart, I'll just talk a little bit to it, is you know, we're a community of practice of subject matter experts across the agency, different programs, different mission directorates. Um, and I get the opportunity here to talk about the great work that people at NASA, their support contractors, but, but to a large extent, commercial entities who do a lot of the system development. And so we try to present an overview of all the systems and how they work together. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, great. Next chart. Super. Um, and so within the uh, our SCLT construct, and there's different uh, system capability teams uh, for different areas, or or in some cases, principal technologists, depending upon the size, for like propulsion, advanced structures, and so we represent um, sort of sometimes called advanced habitation, but we have nine capability areas. I'm going to talk about the ECLIS ones from a closed loop life support area on a, a next chart or two, but I'll just hit on the crew health and performance, you know, also important for going to Mars. Um, and in this forum, you know, things like spacesuit physiology, it's not the spacesuit design, it's how can the crew um, interact with spacesuits, what's the limitation on con ops, uh, injury prevention, uh, crew health and countermeasures. People think of exercise, but it's sensory motor. Do you have the balance? Um, what countermeasures, and a lot of the things on the crew health and performance side are countermeasures. When the crew gets to Mars after nine months of being in space, there's no one to help them out of the space capsule. If you're only there for a short mission for 30 days, um, you don't want to have to spend five, 10 days in the spacecraft until you can get out and start doing science. That, that's why you spent nine months getting there. Um, radiation protection includes monitoring, um, modeling of shielding, uh, supporting mission planning. We have a little bit of advanced work on galactic cosmic ray shielding. It's very difficult to shield against. Um, exploration medical, not the human research program's uh, work, but we do a lot of work with them on what are technologies they need. Um, IV fluids won't last for the round trip of Mars. How do we generate those from potable water? How do we provide medical grade oxygen? Um, in a closed environment without enriching the environment and causing um, you to exceed the oxygen flammability limits. And then food and nutrition, this has been hit on a couple times. Um, people mentioned the deep space food challenge. That, that's something, an area of interest to us. We have X roots um, and uh, Chapia was mentioned on the additive manufacturing, something we're looking to, uh, to put in space food production on a spacecraft costs mass. We have to quantify what's the cognitive and physical benefits to the crew to justify uh, that mass. And then most importantly, food is about 50% water when it's launched. It doesn't take much water. You can't send all dehydrated food like we did on Apollo and expect the crew to eat that and perform well um, for three years. So we're trying to understand um, that because that water represents resupply mass, and as we improve the oxygen recovery, we don't need that water. We'd wind up jettisoning it. Next slide, please. Um, this is, I'll just talk, we talk about envisioned futures. I won't go through all of these. Um, if anyone has a particular topic, um, you know, come see me afterwards. Just showing you, this is where we think in a very chartsmanship-like, we have sort of metrics we try to put behind these. Um, where we think we need to be for different missions in the upper, uh, your right corner is, you know, what missions does it most apply to? You'd see lots of M's there for Mars surface, T's for transit missions and lunar surface. Any improvement benefits, you know, most missions. And so that's just where the biggest impact is. Um, and you'll hear me talk a little bit about, um, you know, reliability, oxygen recovery. Uh, Phoebe mentioned we're around 45% oxygen recovery. When we have a Sabatier processing, and we, when we don't, we're just dumping CO2 overboard, which is lost oxygen. Um, for missions and uh, longer missions, uh, you know, getting to greater than 75% is our target for water. We just recently demonstrating uh, with Brian Processor that Barry's probably going to talk about is um, getting to 98%. Our primary urine processor gets to about 85% water recovery. 
The water processor does a real good job. It's you know, basically full water recovery, but then it's about 50-50 mix. And so by adding the brine processor, that gets our total water recovery close to 98%. And ECLIS is a water economy. You know, we often crack that to, to get the oxygen out for breathing. Um, environmental monitoring, we won't have the fabulous analytical lab capability we have on the ground. How do we replicate some of that capability for speciations of microbes and then chemical constituent identification in addition to total organic carbon that we do today? Also, how do we support forward and backwards planetary protection, quantifying what we might be releasing or characterizing if we think we're bringing something back? Fire safety. Um, uh, partial gravity, we believe, is a, a unique challenge. You have a little bit of buoyancy. You have enough buoyancy to feed the flame, so you don't have a small high temperature flame like a microgravity, but you don't have enough buoyancy to carry away the heat like you do on a terrestrial application. So we have a number of efforts trying to characterize that work. And then logistics, um, trash processing, trash stabilization. Uh, how do we interact with the planetary surface for surface disposal? Um, to protect primarily Mars um, missions. Uh, next chart. Okay. I'm going to go through this in great detail on the uh, <laughs> quiz before anyone can leave. Um, no, just the, the intent of this, this is what we envision as exploration ECLIS, as we'll demonstrate it on ISS. Not all these parts are there yet. Um, on the left side is what we call the air side or the air string. On the right side or the opposite of that is the water string, but there's about 20 boxes on here. The important thing is there's a lot of interactions between these boxes. There's a lot of, um, you know, we got to follow the, the C's, the H, and the O's, you know, the major constituents. But more importantly, that's what we do a good job of when we do demonstrations. But you really need long-term testing to understand where do all the other elements go. And it's those other minor elements that can poison your catalyst, degrade thermal operation. And, and so doing long term integrated testing is really critical to understanding the complexity. And we see space as a partnership between commercial entities, NASA, and some of our international partners. And how do you do all the great work we do, um, but then pull it together to show it works as an integrated system? And we're using the space station to do that. Next chart. Um, this chart, I probably made this too big. I'll get a lot of questions. Um, but. <laughs> This is some analysis. This is just looking on the y-axis uh, spares mass, not installed mass, and of time running across the bottom. And POS is probability of sufficiency. What's the probability you'll have the right spares uh, to perform, have the systems operate the way they need to to maintain um, crew, crew health and performance and survivability? And so if we had left it for Mars in 2008 when we installed the ISS, uh, most of the regen ECLIS systems, we would have, um, you know, required about 8,000 kilograms of spares. Just learning, but there's uncertainty. You really can't test for um, what's the reliability or system. You really have to sort of live it in an integrated fashion. Things fail unexpectedly. There's unexpected interactions. And so getting that increased runtime is, is one of the biggest ways you can save mass on a vehicle. Um, I mentioned already there's the, um, this has sort of built into it different um, carbon reduction, methane pyrolysis, you know, and different technologies coming online to give us that ability. And what's the runtime? Um, I have a reference at the end. There was some additional papers that can talk about the statistics of it. But if you don't, you know, back in that lower corner, that's what you need to take, you know, open loop um, just for a round trip mission to Mars. Uh, next chart. Um, this is what we call our stepping stone. You know, we're, we're targeting sort of our most challenging case is um, transit to Mars because microgravity have a lot of phase separation challenges or long mission phases. Um, and uh, so you've got to look at that and then step back. How do you use all these other missions as stepping stones for demonstrating to build up that reliability of systems? Um, next chart. And sort of takeaways. Um, you know, space is complicated, as everyone here knows. Um, but understanding those complex interactions over time so problems can evolve. Um, if I pick on Sabatier a little bit. You know, it's a process that's been known for over 120 years. 
We flew at the space station. We understood it pretty well, but there's some minor interactions of chemicals, you know, contaminate those catalysts. And that's what you really need to understand. You can't just do a tech demo for six months and you'll understand the basic process, but how do you mature that through long-term uh, operations? As I mentioned, spares mass reduction. Um, what's the uncertainty of your understanding of mean time between failures? Um, NASA, we're trying to figure out how do we put that into specifications for future vehicles. And then CO2 reduction uh, and, and improving that will bring down the installed mass and the consumable mass pretty significantly. And we're taking water out of the food. Um, see, I already talked the last couple points. But it, even though I'm t pointing to existing technologies or technologies we have in the pipeline, it doesn't mean that everything we need for Mars is developed today. It's just going forward as new tech promising technologies come forward, we need to plan in how do we test them sufficiently um, to have that reliability we need and how do we integrate them into larger systems so we understand the interactions. And that's all I have. Oh, one, one more chart. Um, most people are familiar with ICES, International Conference of Environmental Systems, a good place you can look online or attend. And if you're interested in the crew health and performance side, there's a human research program, investigators workshop typically in February is a good forum for learning about that. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. All right, bringing up the rear. Well, we get those going, I'll just introduce myself. So I'm Barry Finger, Vice President of Engineering at Paragon. And unless Darren knows something, I don't know. I'm still the chief engineer. So uh, I don't know. Do you know something? <laughs> Did I not say that? No, you didn't. It's all I'm, good. I'm sorry. But, but yeah, I'm still an engineer. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've, I've been very fortunate to work in ECLIS my entire career. Started at Kennedy Space Center, worked at NASA JSC. And I've either worked for, under, or been a customer to everyone on this panel. So. Um, <laughs> So I've been with Paragon 16 plus years now though, so, but a great group. ECLIS is a very small community and we all do work together to go get this job done. Um, seconds, away. seconds away. Yeah. All right, so there it is. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So what I'm gonna do, a lot of the points, but Phoebe made great points. Everyone here has made good points and you'll see them in my charts too. I'll try to talk to them a little bit different. And I'll tell you a little bit about Paragon too. I, I imagine still, Probably half the people in the audience here don't know Paragon. But we're, we've been around for a long time, although we, we're, we still consider ourselves almost a new space company. We're in our 29th year. Um, we, we're located in, in three different states, Arizona, Denver, uh, Houston, I'm sorry, Texas and, and uh, Colorado. And, and uh, have a couple, our headquarters is in Tucson, Arizona. We have two facilities there, a facility in Denver and two facilities now in, in Houston. And uh, if you look over on the right over there, I'm just kind of taking you kind of through Paragon, but also turning to introduce to, to, to life support. ECLIS is what, you, what everyone's been talking about here, but it touches everything on the vehicle. So we're fortunate we do life support. We, uh, that's the HALO, we're, we're the ECLIS, in, integrated ECLIS supplier to Northrop Grumman for the HALO program. Uh, I'm over for Sierra Space right now, we're delivering radiators. And that's, you know, radiators and heat rejection, all of that, ECLIS is one of the largest loads on, on the thermal control system in a spacecraft. ISRU, as we go to Mars and the moon, uh, this whole idea everyone's talking about, we can't bring it all with us. ISRU is going to be input, in situ resource utilization, provide input of, of whether it's carbon dioxide, water, into the system so we can be more reliant on the local environment. Uh, soft, uh, soft suit systems and soft goods, and I'll talk a little bit about that more. We do a little bit in space tourism as well um, and did some neat things there in the past. And uh, yeah, I think that's good enough for this chart. We can go on to the next. Uh, and this is just to introduce, this is one of the newer, newer things Paragon's doing, although it's not new to us, really. Over on the left-hand side is a picture from our Stratex mission that started over a decade ago. This was a near space uh, 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 mission for, for a private uh, a customer. We took them to 136,000 feet uh, in a little less than a three-year uh, duration, mission, three years of duration for that mission. Uh, you can see that's an, that's an integrated ILC, do, uh, I'm sorry, an ILC Dover spacesuit that we integrated there. Paragon was the integrator and the, basically ran that program. So is the, is the documentary still on Netflix? Uh, it is, yeah. So, so, so I, if you haven't watched it, you've got to go watch it. It's, it's a, four it's minutes a, and 27 seconds from Earth, I believe is the title. It's, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's, it was a really fun program, full up aerospace. 
an example of commercial space. Uh, uh, this, is, this was not a stunt by any means. Um, and I actually tell people where I'm here today because he lived. And, uh, <laughs> and he actually flew three times before we set, did the record. Um, over on the right is a new addition to Paragon. We uh, purchased uh, Final Frontier design uh, earlier this year. And what that did for us was bring in the suit systems to, to Paragon. Uh, you see an IBA suit there that we now have in our portfolio, as well as an EVA suit in development. Uh, we're, we're excited about that. Uh, we've been delivering hardware under the XEMU program, and we'll find out about uh, other things coming up here soon. So uh, we're very excited about that. It brings a lot of capabilities. We're really excited to, to couple the soft goods together with the portable life support system in the, in the ECLIS side of the space to bring that all together and offer that to the, to the market. Next slide. Okay, so um, a little bit on, on ECLIS again going into further. You guys have probably seen, I call it like the, you know, that, that, the, that chart. I'm not going to go into the details, but what it's showing is the flow basically of, of water, of oxygen, uh, some solid waste products. But that flow interaction of all these unit processes, and Jim showed a version of this, it's more like a schematic. But ECLIS is a true system of systems. And, and that, that brings with it some complexity. If you hit the next button. Um, I, I just last a like, little bit about Paragon 2. Th this is just showing all of the different type of uh, products that we have uh, 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 providing to the market for the various uh, parts of, of, of closed loop ECLIS. And go to the next. So it is complex, as I was saying. So it's a complex in endeavor when you look at the integrated system level. And you can keep going. Um, and, and, it, it, and so when you look at it that way, it's a complex system. There's no doubt about it. A lot of those interactions, things you don't expect to see happen, happen once you get all of those subsystems operating together. And um, yeah, so, oops, go back. You're, you're, there you go. Just leave, yeah, leave it right there. So when you break it down, though, this is one of, kind of one of the points I, I strive for at our company and I think for the market overall. Uh, because the integrated system is complex, you have to resist making the sub-elements complex. You, you have to strive for simplicity in your design and the physical processes you're implementing because, because if, you, if you get complex at that level, it just explodes when you come up a level again and you try to make all these things work together. So, uh, that's just one thing I would offer to the community is when you're, when you're designing these systems of systems, use physics to your advantage, use simple processes, and, uh, and you'll, you'll be better off. You can, you can get there. Uh, I, and just for an aside from ECLIS, but the day and age where we are now, you have to be affordable. You have to get it done in a time frame that, that, that the, whether it's the government or a private customer is willing to, to stand for. And so that means you really have to look for these, the, anywhere you can get efficiency in doing the system. Next. So just go ahead. Uh, redund Phoebe mentioned this, but redundancy is a really good thing, especially when we get further and further away. Dissimilar redundancy is even better. And, uh, and so it's not just at the component level or the subsystem level. It's at the supplier level, having different ways to get it done. And um, it's at the vehicle level, uh, mobility. All of those things are really important. Uh, and, and in addition to the, the technology that we work on as part of the ECLIS. And next. So I don't know if anyone said this, but I've, I've been maintaining this for years. No new, despite us having the BPA, Brian Processor Assembly, but we were talking about that up here. It's, it's versions of the BPA exist going back to the 60s, actually. We were lucky enough to get the contract when NASA uh, finally decided to go, let's go implement it. But no fundamental new technology is required. Uh, what, there's that TV show that's on called For All Mankind. I imagine some of you have seen that where the Apollo program kept going. If somehow the Apollo program had kept going and not stopped, we would be on Mars already with 80s, 90s technology. There's no doubt about it. And um, so that's, that's one thing I try to put out there too is we don't need to wait for someone to invent the next greatest thing in ECLIS or a lot of other parts of space flight to go do the, the, what we want to go do here, which is go to Mars. Go next. And I lost my graphics here because they had some video problems. But um, this last one is about testing. And, and again, Phoebe mentioned this, but it, uh, just to say why this is important. Compared to essentially every other spacecraft uh, system, ECLIS is the least built as a unique uh, implementation and then flown. You can still count on probably mm, maybe 10 fingers and a little bit more of the total number of sp human spacecraft that have ever been designed and built and flown. And that's a very low number. And, and testing is incre incredibly important. So next slide. Uh, I'm just going to end with this. My final thoughts is, 
is, you know, again, the ECOS community, like, kind of get the sense of, we all kind of know each other, we're small. Uh, with everyone up here, everyone included on the panel, we're ready to go do this. We do need customers, and we need a sustained commitment by whether it's governments or private entities to go make it happen. So. All right, so for the next, I uh, say, 20 minutes or so, we're going to kind of go through some, some questions that uh, we have put together as a, as a panel, um, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So, so my first question is for Barry. Um, oh. and you, well, you know, okay, go ahead. I, I'll take it. Yeah. So, and you talked a little bit about this already. You, you know, what do you see as the biggest challenge, you know, for environmental control and life support systems for emission to Mars? I, I mean, is it dormancy? You know, what, what do you see kind of as that big challenge that, you know, we still have to overcome? So, I have to say more than one properly. We talked about testing. I really think that's important. And what historically what the problem has been is uh, – uh, the community doesn't invest in that long-term testing. And inevitably, the budgets get added up and stacked up, and ECLIS starts to be treated like another subsystem on a spacecraft, and they'll figure it out. So that, that's one. And we talked about redundancy, but I'll talk about it in the way of, again, it's similar. Is it just spacecraft are developed, the normal cycle, you know, the, the, the mission managers have mass, mass reserves, and, but it starts getting dwindling down, and we get less and less and less. But to get to redundancy, even if we get better, we get lighter, it takes mass and volume to go get that redundancy there. So redundancy is an important one. And then for one we haven't talked about, which again, is it is technical, but it's not the hardware part of it. I call it requ uh, requirements creep. Um, if you, if you want to go do something, if you want to have it make a decade, take a decade to go do it, just keep changing the requirements. Uh, create, keep, hold your requirements review and, and have 40% of them not be uh, defined and set. So. Uh, again, at, at the program level, committing to a set of requirements that we know is, gives us high probability of keeping the crew alive, it gives us almost as high a probability of completing the mission. That's one thing NASA still, you got to separate completing the mission successfully from keeping the crew alive. We all agree, we all need to agree you got to keep the crew alive. If on that first mission you don't land, if you do a flyby and come back and, and you've got a sustained program, you're going to be okay. So that's my answer. So anyone else want to jump in on that one? I think reliability would be very important as well. I mean, you kind of hit on it with redundancy, but really the systems have to be operational. Um, the alternative's not good. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's no going back? <laughs> <laughs> Jim, I don't, Phoebe, I don't, any? Okay. All right. Um, actually, I think... Uh, as well, both of those points, uh, definitely true. I also think from a manufacturability issue, that's not something that we talk about enough in, in the ECLIS community. Um, there are so many technologies that we've developed for ISS that uh, are uh, a, lot of, a lot of us probably cannot manufacture the same components anymore, and that requires, <laughs> requires us to go back and do requalification, so that's some uh, it's it's not as easy to go and use the same old technology that we've we've done before if you have to go and find a whole new way to make it. I, I thought uh, we just so hit the replicator button. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, yes. So uh, that's another issue I think that we don't talk enough about that um, is, is a big one. Especially especially when we start to scale up these mission sizes and the crew the, the crew sizes. Uh, using custom parts that are hard to manufacture uh, is, is not going to get a lot of people to Mars. All right, so this uh, next question is for Jim, the hard questions. <laughs> so assuming we're at the moon by the end of this decade, right, which, you know, we should be there, right? we got plenty of time. How do we transition to Mars? Uh, you know, I, I saw in one of the banners downstairs says you know, we want to be on Mars by 2033 and I think we got a lot to do to get there by 2033 but it, it what, what is the plan you know I, I know we're using ISS as a test bed and, and, and you know is, is there a credible plan a cred credible way to get there uh, you know I'll say within the next 15 years the correct answer is yes um, but no um, I, I think thinking about you know 3033 is a pretty aggressive but you know, if it was a national priority we do have the technologies, but we, you know, we, we, we could fundamentally go. Um, 
getting there fast enough with the rocket is a real challenge. Um, but from an ACLIS perspective, I think we have a good plan. Uh, and I think um, how do we transition from the moon to Mars? You know, to me, I, I see it as we flip it around. What do we need for Mars? And how do you use the moon to demonstrate? Then the moon and cislunar space, the gateway to demonstrate that. Um, I, I think we, we have technology plans. We haven't been able to widely disseminate those yet. I, my understanding is by this October, we're going to be able to roll out some of our gaps in technology plans a little more clearly. Um, and, and so I think we've identified technologies, some technologies for, for certain capabilities. We're still um, evaluating alternatives. We're doing some fly-offs on We're doing demonstrations. Um, but they're going to be commercial vehicles. So how do we communicate and share what NASA has been investing in through a wide selection of, of companies? How do we write requirements to say, you know, what is the probability of sufficiency? How do we um, allocate sort of mass targets and stuff for ECLIS, you know, maybe to a transhab, but then someone else is building the propulsion element. The propulsion element is, um, we know how to build rockets, um, but building big rockets and maintaining the fuel for that long is a real challenge. Um, and, and so for every kilogram we take off ECLIS, and that's one of the reasons we, we talk about reliability testing to bring down um, the mass, every, every kilogram we take off ECLIS is either another e kilogram of science you can take or bring back, or it's five to 15 kilograms of vehicle you don't need to take with you. So. Anyone else? Comments? All right, so this next question is for Phoebe. So um, do you think we're gonna, going to need to bring stuff from Earth, or do you think there's a way that we can do, you know, using ISRU, those types of resources? Do you think, <clears throat> what, what's your thoughts on, on, you know, how much of this stuff do we need to take? Do we need to set up, like, you know, Amazon warehouses all over the uh, universe, or? <laughs> uh, I think that we probably need a multi-pronged approach. I think that we we both need to focus on uh, having the capability to bring all of, uh, as, as much of the things that we think we're going to need, at least for the, the early stages of the mission, but at the same time, we, we need to work on uh, building out that capability to use the Martian atmosphere, use the water there uh, to make the resources for, for the people. Um, and and closing, closing the loop as well. And, you know, we're going to the moon first, obviously. Are there things from the moon that we can take to Mars? Would that make the mission cheaper? Does that? Yeah, uh, we, can, uh, we can, of course, also use the water on the moon. Uh, as well to uh, for for ISRU to make oxygen uh, and and other things as well. So and also water. <laughs> I'll, I'll add in on that one. Um, so I I'm pretty excited about ISRU. The scale, if you're going to make propellant, is is you know should get economies of scale. It's pretty exciting. Um, but I still think you know we're never going to go open loop. We're never going to be Back in the 70s, nuclear power was going to be too cheap to meter. It was a common, you know, we're still going to be regen ECLIS required. It may change the technologies we select and how far we recycle, but ISRU resources are still pr pretty costly to acquire. And so um, that's some trade space I think uh, still needs um, some work to be done. But I, I agree using the resources, you know, living off the land best we can is an important part of sustainability. And Darren, can I just add in there? Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things, we're, we're all regen ECLIS. We love building our machines that recycle and do all that work. But I will say someone in one of the talks earlier today talked about, they asked, what, what's your biggest concern? And it was transportation, getting to and back from Mars. So I really do think that's an important part of it, that, that uh, we, we get our transportation down. There, there's nothing wrong. We're not failing. If we're backing up the ECLIS, we're re uh, prepositioned assets and things like that, and it, it actually increases mission success. So being open to that, getting the cost of transportation down, getting mass there, I think is really important. All right, next one's for you, Robert. Um, so <laughs> I, I know I know. Be 
for Sierra Space, back when you guys were Orbitech, you had done some, I'll say, near natural life support systems, and I don't know if you guys are still working on them, but, you know, do you see that as something that will be enabling for Mars? Is that something that we could do? Um, do we, would we have enough people, I, you know? Uh, so you're referring to plant-based biological type yeah, life support yeah, near, systems? Yeah, near natural life support systems. So uh, is it required? I, I don't think it would absolutely be required, but I do think there's many benefits to it. Um, I don't think it'll ever replace physiochemical systems that we currently are using, like on station. Uh, but there are some uh, many benefits. Um, we started off with some simple payloads, and we find not just one or two of the crew that uses it like it, uh, the crew have actually been requesting more and more systems for their own psychological benefits and whatnot. Uh, but it also does augment some of the life support capabilities. Plants are great ways to filter water, um, you know, convert CO2, not at the high rates that are necessarily for, for a full crew. Uh, that volume would be excessively large. But uh, there are some benefits there that if something were to happen and you may be able to operate in a degraded mode while you're fixing something, uh, it may augment some but, of that capability. But, but, like, when you get on the surface of Mars, I mean, I, I could see now you have oh. all the area you could possibly want. Is I, well, <laughs> they have to be people. habitable volume. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, you know, the pressure is so low on Mars. That, that's the challenge. Right. Yeah, it has to be a challenge. pressurized volume. Uh, one of the big advantages of plants as well, uh, which, you know, we've grown plants on station, is fresh food. The crew really, really enjoy it. Uh, from a sensory and taste pers uh, perspective, but also they're finding that um, during the extended duration, some of the dehydrated food is losing some of its micronutrients, uh, something that the fresh food can provide. So there's some health reasons there as well. I know we've never done plant-based systems, so I, I don't know if anybody else. Oh, I've done them in the past, but I started out at Kennedy. That's what I did for the first five years. I'm a big believer in the technology, and, and I think when you get to these planetary surfaces for the long term, I haven't seen the technology come along yet uh, where, where uh, that would not play a role. It might be highly engineered. Uh, there's a lot, so much going on in greenhouse agriculture today, vertical agriculture, people that follow that. It's a really amazing. They're getting the footprint smaller and smaller. Um, so I, for long term, I see, I see it as that's the, that's the path I see for long term life support. The, our, the physiochemical systems we build, as good as they are, they're still these machines. And just, I guess this, I'll make my point with this. Uh, biology, life on Earth has got two and a half, three billion years of engineering derivative. You know, it's system after system getting better and better and better. It's a lot of engineering behind the biology. And it's, it's, it works pretty darn well. So. All right, next one's for Jim. Another hard one. International collaboration. Um, <laughs> You know, I know it was one of the big things we, we do on station. And I just, you know, what are your thoughts on international collaboration for Mission to Mars? Um, I, you know, I, I think it's international collaboration uh, as well as working with commercial partners is just part of the fabric going forward. Um, I think Sam Shishimi, Shishimi said this more, or yesterday, you know, we're stronger together you know, if we go together, you know, go fast, you know, go by yourself. But if you want to go there, stay there. You really need that international partnership. They bring some unique uh, capabilities. I don't see it as black and white, though, that if uh, international entities providing a rover or a module, it doesn't mean there's no uh, U.S. Uh, components in that. They're free to say, you know, there may be some bartering where we want commonality or we purposely want unlike redundancy. You know, um, it just means that they're responsible for it and the integration activities. So uh, I think having international collaboration and expanded uh, international collaboration is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I think even going beyond what we currently have for ISS is really uh, There's been, be needed for through the Artemis Accords, you know, an increase of countries that aren't part of the original ISS partners, um, you know, from across the globe. And I think that, that, A, it's maintaining U.S. leadership, but by us maintaining that leadership, we can maintain that international collaboration. So we, we I think, as sort of the major stakeholder, you know, keep that door op more open than it could be if other people were leading. Anyone else have thoughts? You know, I think some of the restrictions on us as a, ITAR restrictions make it harder for us as a company to do it and 
I know there's been some work done in the past with through NASA trying to make it easier and you know if, if we can you know the, doing things like EAR it makes it easier if there's yeah I mean we do have to work within that that legal framework there are some some people who want to use our technologies in ways that are not beneficial to any of us and, and so as cumbersome as the rules may seem in the short term I think what we need to do from a policy perspective is figuring out how that's just part of the timeline and, and funding profiles for us to get there. All right, so the, the next thing I had was, uh, I guess I'll go back to Robert, um, talking about the moon as an analog for Mars. You, you know, what are your thoughts on using the moon as an analog? Is it, is it a one for one? Is it, <laughs> I know the answer. <laughs> Well, it's not a one-for-one, one, but I think there are some advantages. Uh, I think, was Barry talked about partial gravity, or was it Jim? I can't remember. Uh, Jim. Jim. Um, you know, there's th some things there with partial gravity. Uh, not only that, but it's a dust environment that we really haven't operated in for a longer duration as well. Um, and somebody else, I think, mentioned some of the delays. You know, how do we work on systems and delays? So it's a stepping stone. Um, Rather than jumping right into the deep end of the pool, it allows us to test and validate some of the assumptions that we're making, the uh, models that we create um, before we take that big leap to Mars where, yeah, you're, you know. You're committed. Yeah, <laughs> you're all in. Um, so I do see some value in it, but it's not one for one. Yeah. Well, maybe add the, I, there's some operational value in analogs to, for, to, you know, um, pre-deploying stuff to Mars, we're going to pre-deploy some stuff. How do we move our logistical consumables for life support or our spare parts? You know, we're not going to land at all. So it allows us to take some baby steps. Also, the gateway and the lunar surfaces are going to have long periods of dormancy that we operationally can't easily exercise um, on ISS. And so to me, we're going to have what we think are good strategies, but we get to test it and when you shut down the system, we can do that on Earth, but microgravity and that lovely capillary force works with you and works sometimes unexpectedly. You know, were you able to maintain control? To me, those are going to be really useful as we built up a, a Mars transit vehicle or we deploy things to a surface ahead of time. As well as the radiation environment, too. That's another uh, big change. Yeah, I was going to ask any thoughts on radiation or dust. Those are, seem to be the two. Big, I don't know. Barry, you got any? Well, on, on radiation, I would just, I think this is an area where NASA has put some good requirements on the HALO uh, program, and, and uh, I feel like, uh, you know, those, those systems be designed a 15-year life in that radiation environment. So I think actually radiation, we're going to be, as an, in, as, as an industry, in pretty good shape. It is the electronics. There are some things with materials and construction that can be affected by uh, uh, radiation. But I think that one's pretty good. Um, you said dust. Um, so... Dust is going to be interesting, and in if you, it's just like we did with Apollo, everyone, I think everyone knows pretty much, we learned the dust was really harsh, and the crew, they probably couldn't have lasted a much more, a couple more EVAs, and their suit was going to stop working, so joints start ro rotating and stuff. So there's going to be learning there, and I think, that, again, this key is, is if we've got um, uh, the whole architecture, the whole approach we have is we're, that first mission is going to be learning. The second mission is going to be learning. It's going to be part of this testing like you guys were just talking about on the moon. So I think we'll be okay, and, but you've got to get in that environment and go, go, um, go live there. And, and, and again, have that. If you had it as a 180-day mission on the moon first and you only go 90, it's not a failure. Understanding that's not a failure. We learned. We got the crew back, and we're going to do better than on that next one. So. Um, I mean, from a radiation perspective, I agree. Avionics, we think we have a reasonable handle, but there's a little bit of a, a knowledge gap in the area of crew displays. We've become so reliant on COTS-type displays. You know, mm -hmm. we throw laptops away on space station. How's that going to work on a round trip to Mars? Um, but I think the human radiation tolerance is, is something we're still learning from. Um, we have limits. HRP's done some, some really good research. Um, but that... You know, we're going deeper in the space and, and staying longer in space beyond the Van Allen belts. And, and so um, the, there, there's still some, ECLIS plays a role in that. You know, we can configure ECLIS systems, consumables, logistics to help with shielding of, of solar events for, for galactic cosmic 
radiation. Um, there's still a lot of policy decisions that need to be made on um, if we can't solve it technically, what do we do? And you've heard some discussions, that's why we need to go faster, is uh, that's a, a mitigation is just to reduce the time in orbit. Super fast. All right, so I think we're going to open up questions to the audience. So it struck me as you were speaking, uh, <clears throat> Phoebe mentioned the manufacturability. Um, I think Barry mentioned uh, the, I lost my train of thought. So basically we've got disparate ideas about what these things are being used for and uh, we have companies that are in business to make money. We have uh, multiple entities all coming together.